Hello, and thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. This talk was recorded at the Cross Labs Innovation Science Workshop, which gathered researchers to talk about open endedness in the context of artificial intelligence and artificial life. Cross Labs is an interdisciplinary research institute dedicated to understanding the mathematical basis of intelligence and life through computational research. Today's talk is from Lana Sinapayan, who is a research scientist at Sony Computer Science Laboratories. Okay, well, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share my ideas today. Um, this talk will not so much be about my research results, but more me sharing some things I've been thinking about recently. So the main topic of this talk is um, failure and research in AI and A-Life. And one of the reasons why I've been interested in this topic recently is because um, a lot of AI research hates the idea of failure. It's more about being the best or the biggest or the most performant, beating the benchmark, being the state of the art. And if on top of that, you can also beat human performance, then it's even better. And um, th this focus on success can be, it's understandable because uh, there is a very short path between AI research and applications, and you don't want to put a failing system, system in the hands of users. Um, but it's also not that great, great when you care not so much about performance, but about uh, understanding a system. And that's what we do in A-Life. We try to build the system to try to understand it. And the issue if you focus only on success is that you can have two systems that succeed at the same task, but succeed in completely different ways, like a plane and a bird. And you shouldn't th think that just because you made a system that succeed at this task, then therefore uh, your, your system can um, explain the biological system that you are trying to imitate. So if you care about understanding the system that you're trying to emulate, then it pro it's probably a good idea to um, try also taking into consideration the kind of failures that your system can have, especially so in synthetic approaches like AI or AI-life. Now, this is, of course, not a new idea to use failure in research. For example, in um, neuroscience or psychology, often you have researchers that will, um, that will examine patients that are missing part of, the, of their brain and look at one kind, what kind of tasks these patients cannot perform. And from there, try to make some generalizations about how a normal brain would, uh, would work. Also in engineering, where when you are trying to reverse engineer a system and you don't have access to the code of the system, something that you can do is force the system to fail by changing the environment or changing the inputs. And then from these failures, you try to identify what kind of system you are, uh, or you are, or you are looking at. And of course, you can also directly manipulate the system when you, when you have a, a chance to do so. For example, with knockout mice, you can deactivate part of uh, the genetic code of the mice and then see what happens and generalize from there, from there uh, um, try, trying to understand the causes and effects in this system. So failure can be a tool to understand, identify, or even manipulate complex systems. Um, <laughs> somebody, could you mute your <laughs> phone? Your, thank you, yes. So um, there could be many different definitions of failures. The kind of failure that I'm interested in is like this. So you have a change from some perform performance at the task to no performance. And the failure is relative, relative to the system that you are currently studying. The failure sh should also be parameter dependent. You don't want something that is completely random and has nothing to do with, with what you are doing. And the main uh, change from a performance first, but perspective is that when you are trying to optimize a system, for example, using genetic algorithm or maybe gradient descent, you are trying to find the optimum of a fitness landscape. And you don't care so much about boundaries, except when they are preventing you from going to one peak to the other. When you are interested in failures, you care almost only about boundaries. So what is the boundary of the system between uh, failure and success? and you don't care so much about high performance. 
so uh, you can you can try to understand complex systems in different ways. One definition of understanding is you understand the system if you are able to derive the effects from the causes. You can try to do that just by observations. So for example, here I have, um, I have a system that is an ant and I choose as failure the ant being dead and as success the ant being alive. And I can just observe the system and mark the points where the ant does something interesting or something bad and dies. I can just look at the system and hope that something interesting will happen. Or I can use interventions and put the ant into a new environment and new situations where it will uh, maybe survive or maybe die. And then when I manage to um, basically draw this space of failure and success of the system, I can use that in different ways. For example, if I'm trying to build an artificial ant, I might want to build a system that shares some of these uh, boundary failures with the actual ant. Or I can try to use this, um, this map as a way to identify other systems. If I find a new animal and I'm not sure if it's an ant or a spider, I could try to draw this, its boundaries and um, compare with what I already know about ants. I can also um, say build an artificial system that has the same boundaries as the biological ant and then make this artificial system fail or manipulate it in some way that helps me understand the real system. So as I said, there are a lot of um, there is a lot of focus in success on success in AI, and for a good reason, because there are a lot of very successful applications of AI. For example, um, image recognition or language models or robot controllers are very successful. But when you look at the way these, these different models fail, it's very clear that they are not failing, fail, failing the same way as humans are failing. And we should probably pay attention to this. So for example, here you have a language model that uh, generated a recipe. So this is actually a rather old language model, but I use it because um, even the newer language models make this kind of mistakes, they just make it less often. So the mistakes that the model does are, for example, a lot of repetitions, chocolate, chocolate cake, one cup of sugar, and then another cup of sugar, and then another cup of sugar, or combined flour, sugar, baking powder, salt, salt, and salt. Um, the system often uh, um, forgets some ingredients. For example, this is supposed to be a chocolate cake, but it has no chocolate. And the physics, um, the physics that the system assumes are very uh, suspicious. For example, it says cook over a medium heat until mixture boils and stiff peaks form. And if you have cooked in your life, you know that it is very, very unlikely to happen. And the kind of mistakes that humans uh, do is more like making typos, which usually AI language models don't do. And also something that it, that is common to the two systems is uh, forgetting ingredients. And then there is the famous example of ad adversarial images. So you have um, image recognition models that are very, very performant. For example, this is a picture of my dog. And the system, um, so the recognition model correctly identifies this dog as a miniature schnauzer. And then if you add, add this, um, specific noise, you, may, you can make, you can force the model to make mistakes. So now the model does not know anymore what kind of dog this is or even whether it's a dog or not. But what is interesting is that you as a human, if you recognized a dog in the first picture, probably still recognize the dog in the other pictures. And then there is the issue of superhuman performance. So there were at some point a lot of headlines about this model uh, beats humans at, at image recognition. Uh, we have superhuman performance in that model. And when you look at uh, the, Im the images where humans make a mistake and the model does not make a mistake, you get these kinds of examples. So this is an image. Uh, as a human, you might say, this looks like a jury or some kind of show. 
and you would say this answer, you would be wrong and the model would be right. And the model would say, uh, would guess that the correct lab label is hamster and that's the actual answer. And that's very hard for a human to guess this. So that we really want to call this superhuman performance. Here are other examples of uh, human versus AI. So in the first picture, you are human. You might say this is a missile and you would be wrong. The correct answer is projectile. So one of the questions that I have is on top of having this uh, com completely different way to fail between the models and the humans in AI, does a life also have this kind of problem? Do we even have benchmarks? And if we have benchmarks in a life, uh, do we also have this issue of superhuman or super biological performance that is that is actually not uh, real? Now there are also some models that can actually replicate human failures, and this is a project I'm working on with my colleagues. So what they did is uh, train train a neural network to predict videos. So you give the model a, a video of people going to Disneyland and you train the model, the model to predict the next frame of the video. And then once you are satisfied with the performance of the model, you can use it to um, basically predict uh, new kind of inputs. And what was interesting with this research is that um, you have this famous visual illusion which is called the rotating snake. And a lot of people see motion in this image, not everyone, but a lot of people, I think 75% of people. And when you show this illusion to the predictive model, it predicts that this image is moving and it's rotating, rotating in the same um, direction as humans perceive. And when you break the illusion, so you give a broken version of the illusion to the model, then no motion is predicted. So you have uh, the same uh, boundary of um, this kind of perception failure between the model and the human. And what is good with illusions, whether they are visual illusions or not, is that um, it's a perceptual failure. And you know that something is not right in what you perceive. And it's an interesting kind of, kind of failure because we are not, it's, it's striking as a failure and we are not quite sure why this failure ha uh, happens. But thanks to this kind of research, you can, you can think that maybe we see visual illusions because we are trying to predict the world. Because that's what the artificial model does and it sees the same kind of illusion as we do. So what I did is uh, now that you have this, mod this model that can detect illusions, you can also use it, use it to generate new illusions. So here I used this trained model as a judge and I generate new images with using the same kind of network that uh, um, Sebast Sebastian used in his research as, as he, he explained yesterday. So um, pattern producing networks. And then I evolved these networks to make the best possible illusion. So an image that is static, but the model predicts that this image should be moving. And then I try to create new visual illusions like these images. So you might see some motion or see no motion. It's, re it's really dependent on people. But some of these illusions have a, a rather high rate of people who say that they see a, a motion. So the methodology for that research was you find the failure that you think is interesting in a biological system. And then you replicate this failure in an artificial system. Then you use this artificial system to find new kinds of failures. And to close the loop, you check that uh, these failures also correspond to your uh, biological system. That was for AI things. Uh, I'm also interested in AI life. So one of the things that I wonder is, do we have, uh, um, can we do the same kind of thing in AI life? So there are lots of successful uh, AI life research topics that this is just a list of things that I like. But we also have interesting studies of failure in AI life. For example, everything that has to do with evolved death. If you consider the death as the ultimate failure of life, then all of this uh, research about how death can be useful for ecosystems is very interesting. 
also everything that has to do with minimal cells. So you have a cell and you remove from this cell as much as you can while still maintaining the properties of life. So you're really looking for the minimal limit where you have very little in this cell, but still the cell can maintain itself and stay alive. So some of the questions that I have is, where could failure studies be interesting? For example, uh, maybe in consciousness science, conscious versus unconscious, can we make an artificial system where you have some inputs and some of this input uh, is processed consciously and some is processed unconsciously and somehow this boundary should be the same as uh, what, we, what, what we can see in humans or open-ended evolution, reinforcement learning, evolutionary simulation and fitness. So that's something else I'm interested in. And what I've been doing recently is trying to use um, failure as a way to direct evolution. So this is an example where you have, uh, again, ants and the green part is the land and the uh, blue part is water. And if the ants go into the water, then they die. Now the ants are eating these red spots as food. And if you have a perfect species of ants and they know that if they go in the water, they will die. Therefore, they never go into the water. The day that you have an ant with an interesting mutation that makes it uh, able to survive, survive in water, this mutation will not propagate into the population because um, it never even tries to go into the water. If you have a different species of ant where if, even if it dies, it still sometimes tries to go get the food into the water, then when you have an interesting mutation that happens that make them resistant to water, then this mutation is more likely to propagate into the population. So I'm trying to use this uh, idea to make, uh, uh, how to, to evolve systems that have inter interesting ways to fail. So what I'm doing right now is using this uh, classical pole balancing task, where the goal is to keep the pole upright on the cart. And I'm trying to optimize the number of ways that um, these agents can fail. So you can fail maybe by, by just rotating the pole of the tie all the time or always going right, always going left. And the idea is that maybe if you optimize different kinds of failure, then when you have an interesting mutation that uh, up appears in the system, you are able to um, keep this mutation in and ha have more interesting behaviors. So this is the end of my talk. To summarize the open question that I have, um, do we have any benchmarks in AI life? And we have the same kind of issues that are in AI with super biological performance. Uh, where could failure studies be interesting, maybe in consciousness science or evolutionary simulations? And are there any concepts that we could redefine in terms of uh, success failure boundary? for example, intelligence or open-ended evolution or life. Thank you for your attention. And now we have some questions from the audience. The first question is from Olaf. Uh, sh sure, yeah. So, so I really like the idea of, uh, of I guess it's about perception, uh, perceiving something not completely right. And I guess it can come either from the agent itself or a subset of the agent. Uh, cognitive mechanism or something, or I guess an observer that is external or something you fixed uh, uh, prior to the experiment uh, in an external way. So that's how I guess goals are defined. Uh, and I guess similarity to errors, it can be either self-supervised or supervised from, from, from an external point of view or self-directed or, or outside directed. So I guess this relates to, to the discussion that we had on the first day of the workshop about the uh, functions and exaptations. It's kind of the same, same kind of question that I have. So, so how, how, how do you think, um, how does the way you formally define those failures mm -hmm. with respect to, to an observer or in a self-directed kind of way affect your observations uh, on the failures? So I guess, um... It's the same question that you would have for fitness, right? Or for performance. Yeah. 
And yeah, ob obviously the definition of failure is very subjective and mm. you should, um, should adapt your definition to what you are trying to do, right? For example, in my uh, visual illusion research, I said that um, if you see a visual illusion, this is a failure. Of course, that's very subjective because it's a failure from the point of view of prediction. You're, you're saying this image is moving and it's not moving, but it's, um, this is not necessarily always a failure because it's a side effect of, of you being very performant at, at predicting normal images. And this image is not a normal image that you would find in the world. And so you could say, this is not a failure. It's just a sign that my system is working correctly, for example. Mm. <clears throat> so does that pose a problem if, if you define your own failure? Yeah, there's a sort of a infinite regress in you looping into yourself, which is interesting, but... Um, I don't know if it's a problem. I think that it's interesting, especially for visual illusions, because if you don't notice that something is wrong, it's not an illusion, right? You make a mistake, and you don't notice that there is a mistake, then it's not an illusion for it to be an illusion. You have to realize that your perception is not correct. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it's a problem, but I do think it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. OK, and then um, there was a, it's not a question, but a comment from Bert that evolution of death is interesting. Bert, did you have any question you wanted to ask about that right now? or? Uh, yeah. you. Uh, thank you for the talk, Lana. Um, for the you, you, one of the slides you talk about the evolution of death, and I think uh, even biology, they, uh, there's some uh, discussions in biology that uh, why do death, uh, uh, why death is there, like. Uh, but uh, my my understanding is that uh, evolution needs uh, death. Uh, if there's no death, then everything will just grow and grow, and there's no place for for evolution to to uh, to actually implement. So, uh, what is your 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 uh, idea on this, or uh, do you know of any uh, work uh, on this issue? So, um, what you said is now uh, I think it's accepted by by part of the community that death is useful, but it it's, this wasn't always the case. It used to be very controversial that death can be useful. And the slide that I have here is some research by uh, Justin Weafel, who uh, he had a hard time publishing this research because um, basically nobody wanted to be, believe, believe that uh, um, death could evolve as a control mechanism. And what he found in this paper was that if you have a system where there is no space, so you just stimulate agents and Sometimes randomly they can eat some resources and they have the choice to die or not. If you just do that, death will never evolve in your system. But if you have a 2D space where uh, um, the agents actually have a position in space and they are next to each other, then you can have the evolution of death because agents that basically protect their own environment from being over uh, exploited are more adaptive that, than agents that just eat everything and kill everything in, the, in their path, basically. Okay, um, great. So the next question is from Sina. Oh, uh, should I say this out loud? Oh, yeah, that'd be helpful. <laughs> okay, so sorry. Um, yeah, basically, uh, first of all, thanks for the great talk. Um, I, I really liked, especially the uh, the example with the with the illusions. I know I've seen, I think, on Twitter some of your examples before, but seeing it in this context was really insightful. I was curious um, how you might like in in the pull cart task, because because I I imagine every single task what you call failure has to be sort of handcrafted. And uh, just as a curios out of curiosity, I'm curious. Like that's a lot of curious. Uh, I'm curious how many uh, how you quantified it in in the pull cart case because. That one, I feel like it should be more difficult, but maybe you have a clever way. Just, just, just so in case, like if I ever wanted to try something like this, trying to figure out what the thought process is behind it. So you're right that for the pull cut, it's very difficult to define failure. And we didn't start with this task. Actually, we started with a bipedal walker. 
And in the bipedal walk, uh, we define failure as um, basically falling down and stop or stopping moving. That's a failure. And when we wanted to maximize the diversity of failures, we just uh, wanted to maximize the, um, the X at which the agent basically falls down or stops moving. And the idea was that if you have a ton of agents using the same uh, terrain and they all fail at different points of the terrain, that, then um, they have very di diverse behavior, basically. Maybe one cannot climb, one cannot go down, one, one cannot jump, something like that. And in that case, failure was easy to define, but for the polycat, it's much harder <laughs> to define what is failure because um, the, the fitness, uh, the amount of reward that the agents get is always changing because this pole is very unstable. And so you don't really have a clear moment where you go from a lot of performance to like no performance. And I don't really like this polka task actually, but um, it's the simplest task that we could find. So that's why we used it. <laughs> and in that case, we define failure as um, the amount of reward that the agent got for one run, basically. So I you see, could, yeah, it's not, it's not ideal and it's not what I initially wanted to do, but we're trying to see if we can get, get anything interesting from this definition and then expand it to more, um, more interesting. And it seemed to there. work though, right? Like I think in your figure, you showed that you guys got some pretty nice uh, performance after. Uh, wait, I don't remember. Where. Oh yeah, um, so it's it's strange, but it seems to work even better than some other methods. And I'm not sure if I really believe this result for now. <laughs> it's a good result, but I'm not convinced by by it yet. Um, okay. But it, the reason why we got some performance here is that uh, we maximized the variance between the fitness of the different agents as a way to say you should have very different fitnesses for the very different agents. And maybe that means that they have very different behaviors. And one easy way to increase this variance is to have some agents that just completely fail and the pole never moves and the fitness is zero all the time. And some agents that are very good and the pole is always uh, upright. And if you want to have that, then you need to evolve some agents that are very good. I see. Okay, cool. Thank you for, their, for your answer. Okay, great. And um, there was a comment in the chat for Amadi. Amadi, did you have a question that you wanted to ask? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk. Very interesting. And I had so, you know, one thing that you can see it in two ways. For example, uh, you are working on the AI failures according to the human perception. Okay. Uh, you know, and at the same time, you're talking about illusions that they are human failure in perception of reality. So, but we know, for example, that uh, what we know as illusion, they are not, they are indeed, they are not really illusion. By the time we are trained to have some illusions, to have a better perception of reality. So, like this, we can make some good failure for AI. Yeah, like defining some artificial illusion for AI that help AI to have a better, you know, understanding of the process or making better whatever that is the goal of the AI. So if we see it in this way, how you see it? Um, so if I understood uh, your comment is that we could train an AI to detect illusions? Yeah, I mean, to, to, do, to have failure, mm -hmm. okay? And that, okay, failure, so is good. The... that failure is good, good failure, you know? Okay. <laughs> so it's a bit different from what I'm doing because um, I didn't train the model to reproduce humans fa human failures. Instead, the model was trained on a completely uh, different task. And by chance, this task made the model able to have the same illusions as humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that is more interesting than training it to have the right kind of failures, because 
if you have the failure as a kind of um, evolved mechanism or a side effect, uh, you can say that you have more explanatory power over why we have these failures. Whereas when, when you just train the model to reproduce human failures, you, don't, you still don't know why this failure is here in the human. All you know is that you can reproduce it with your system. The, the human failures, for example, human illusions, it is, you know, somehow proof that are good, you know. That um, they, are, they call it, for example, illusion or human mistake, but in reality, they are not mistakes, you know. I don't know about this. But person. they, you know, in, in reality, we have seen, I don't mean in general, they have seen that those failures, those illusions of human mm -hmm. helps human for better perception of reality you know i don't like, think i know this research but it's it's not interesting and i would probably agree with that research so like awesome. I, because of what i said we can train ai for mm -hmm. a good failure you know to assist ai mm -hmm. yeah i agree okay. with that cool so maybe if Madi has any of the uh, links to any of these papers or things that would be really useful to share yeah, sure 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 Cool. Um, so just to stay on schedule, I think we have time for one more question and uh, we'll take a question next was uh, Dennis. And then if anybody else has questions, you're welcome to post them in the discord and uh, maybe we'll make sort of continuing failure discussion one of the topics for later. But uh, um, uh, Dennis, Thanks. did you want to ask your question? Yep. Yeah. So it, it seemed to me that uh, when we're trying to do any sort of divergent search uh, or create open-endedness in evolution, for example, that the failure would be convergence, uh, which when we're evolving an agent to do a, like a cart pull balancing task is actually what, what we're hoping to get uh, and what we get fairly easily. So I'm wondering, uh, is, is the failure uh, of an open-ended system convergence towards one point? And, and if it is, can we learn anything from that type of failure? So it's in the case where failure is equal to convergence, right? I, my supposition is that failure for an open-ended system, uh, for an open-ended evolution specifically, would be convergence, but I'm, I'm not sure uh, if you would so agree with that. So that would be the, the, the failure of open-endedness. If, if it's convergent, then it's not open-ended. And can we learn from something from that? From that? So um, yesterday, we had a very interesting discussion about this, which was uh, humans, we assume that humans are open-ended systems. And when we put a human in a for example, when somebody is playing a game like Minecraft or any other kind of game, usually they can play this game in an open-ended way because they are humans and they have a lot of imagination. They can make, make up rules. And so can you, do you always get an open-ended system when you start with an open-ended system and add something to it? Or can you make a system, an open-ended system not open-ended by adding something to it? Can you make it fail at being open-ended by added, adding something to the system? And I think that would be an interesting way uh, to study failure in open-ended systems, to try to find the conditions in which uh, you can force the system to not be open-ended and to become very predictable and converge. Thanks. All right, that will be the end of the questions. Thanks everyone for joining.